Hello, I'm Nathaniel Osgood from the Computational Epidemiology and Public Health Informatics Lab at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, I'm going to, in this talk, provide um, only the very uh, briefest and skeletal um, discussion of a topic uh, covered uh, much more extensively in a, in a separate video. Um, and the topic here is, is cross-leveraging data science and system science to help us under, uh, understand the impacts of uh, highly trained service dogs on uh, veterans who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, further are, are um, experience challenges with, uh, with opioids. So um, while this vignette um, is going to focus on, on this particular case of, of service dogs and their impact on veterans, it's more broadly a metaphor for a lot of interventions where um, we seek to move beyond coarse-grained understanding of outcomes, um, perhaps measured only uh, occasionally, um, and to, to, to allow us to delineate, in the words of, uh, of critical realism, the generative pathways by which those effects uh, are felt. The particular focus here, though, is is one on um, around uh, the looking at this this impact of the service dogs um, who are highly trained by uh, the Automus uh, group, um, which has an extraordinarily rigorous, well codified, um, tested, um, uh, and and quite um, uh, chronologically extensive program for training service dogs. Um, and we're looking at the impact of that on the functioning of, of the uh, paired veterans. Uh, this is work conducted with uh, my colleague Colleen Dell, uh, who serves as um, really the, the lead uh, principal investigator in this, as, as um, uh, in, in a reflection of her fact as uh, a research chair within uh, the addictions uh, area. Um, but it includes a variety of other partners. This is a, a case crossover trial. Um, it's very small in duration, although we're hoping to uh, grow its size. The research questions here um, uh, are varied, but many of them focus on the, uh, trying to understand the generative pathways by which impacts, um, uh, often benefits for a veteran, are, are realized, and whether there's there's differences in those pathways um, uh, between cases where it's been successful and not, or cases where it's yielded much benefit compared to only modest benefit, or the particular pathways to effect which provide the greatest uh, gain. And to, to appreciate this, it's very important to realize that, um, as with uh, many interventions on complex systems, when one undertakes an intervention, um, it often has many particular generative pathways, causal pathways, pathways by which it can ripple through and affect outcomes of interest. In this case, perhaps the most uh, familiar of these is, is the time the dog spends with the veteran. But there's many other pathways. One is, for example, the greater amounts of structure in the life of, of, of the veteran introduced by the dog's needs. Another is the fact the dog takes them outside of their home and, and enhances physical activity and sedentary behavior. Another way is that time outside the home leads to social contact with others um, in the community which can lower their sense of isolation. Um, uh, also, the dog brings them into contact with the service dog community, which lowers their sense of isolation. And finally, because these are um, highly trained service dogs, they can intervene in, and there's a formal term for it, interrupt um, cases where the veteran is feeling stress, uh, in, even to the point of interrupting flashbacks before they take physical effects. Um, and all these things can ripple through to, to outcomes of interest, such as uh, substance use, uh, senses of well-being, um, risk of suicidal ideation, etc. So uh, while um, AI methods um, and advanced computational methods are sometimes held up as, as um, uh, in, counterposed to an intention with theory as an alternative to theory, um, I think that's really uh, underserving their, the breadth of their potential. While it is true these methods allow us to recognize salient empirical regularities, um, they further allow us to, to inform and build theory and to explicate theory. And I'm going to be trying to emphasize this breadth uh, here. So we're making use here of, of uh, tools from the uh, toolbox of data science that are, are uh, richer in the set of data that they provide, very temporarily fine-grained, um, very detailed in terms of the pathways depict at the level of an individual's progression trajectory. Um, 
and particularly we're going to make use of mobile data collection this makes uh, this work makes central use of the ethica platform um, which is our generation three um, platform for smartphone based data collection it exists on androids and in iphones um, as well as having as an app but as well as having a uh, very rich uh, online presence in terms of uh, defining studies um, graphically in terms of defining their their surveys graphically specifying declaratively their um, uh, their triggering conditions etc and then using that same website um, the dashboard on the website to monitor um, levels of, of adherence on the part of study personnel, um, the data as it's coming in, and to perform analytics with that data. This is a system which allows us to customize uh, particular components for a given study, um, the user interface, the sampling regime in terms of sensors, the, um, uh, the question errors, and the rules for triggering them without programming. Um, in the large majority of, of uh, cases, we don't need programming. But for cases where we want to create a custom app, um, programming is an option or very specific triggering conditions. Um, in this case, we're making use of both traditional instruments through interviews, classic survey instruments that are validated, such as PDQ-9 uh, scale for, for depression. But we're also making use of, of the wearables uh, in the form of Fitbit, um, collecting heart rate and sleep in the smartphone, both to collect the information from the wearables, but to issue microsurveys, these ecological momentary assessments, which can include rich questions such as gathering photo and audio. We're further gathering uh, information from sensors on the smartphone uh, via Ethica, as, um, as well as delivering those microsurveys via, via Ethica as well. The dogs are, are uh, carrying here Bluetooth beacons, um, which allows us to determine the distance at any one time between the smartphone and the dog within a, a broad range um, to estimate that distance, which can give us a very clear sense as to how much time the veteran is spending with the dog. This information is configured via the Ethica website when one defines a study via this graphical uh, interface. And we're tracking um, a variety of these uh, measurements um, for very specific reasons. The Bluetooth beacon signal strength, the strength of the signal received from this on the smartphone gives us a sense of proximity to dog. GPS on the phone gives us a sense of, of uh, geographic mobility and entropy, the predictability of their of their toings and fro froings, but also um, gives us a sense of how much time they're spending indoors and outdoors. Um, we can look through detecting signals from other Bluetooth beacons, such as in other dogs. We can look at time spent with um, the veterans uh, when they're with their dogs. In other studies, we actually might label the, the phones of other veterans, for example, uh, with a, a little sticky, which can allow us to uh, to measure distance to them or, or via, um, uh, via um, lanyards. Um, uh, we can also measure uh, accelerometry and heart rate to give a sense of physical activity, sedentary behavior, and, and, and sleep quality um, via the, uh, the Fitbit and with potential some benefit also from the smartphone data. And flashback occurrence, um, um, we're anticipating being pretty well shown by a variety of, of the sensors um, uh, combined with their self-report. There's a variety of self-reported components, uh, including aspects of PTSD symptoms, human dog bond, substance use that we depend on. And some of these are delivered on device and some with traditional instruments. The end result of this is a very detailed longitudinal picture of the progression of an individual along many different components, all cross-linked in time and for that individual, which can give us a very rich picture of that individual's um, uh, progression over time, particularly in light of the fact that dog is getting training over time um, so that uh, they're benefiting the later stages of the program from a very well-trained dog in a way that was not true early on. And we can look at how that impacts occurrences such as flashbacks, um, poor sleep, social engagement, moderate to vigorous physical activity, etc. So when we think about these pathways to effects, if we think about traditional instruments, um, um, they can give uh, limited knowledge of, of certain pathways and, and often in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that's very coarsely spaced uh, temporally. Using the data from the phones and the wearables, um, 
and the uh, the surveys issue on the device, we can get a very fine-grained picture across multiple pathways as to what's going on. And this is key. And it's not only across many pathways, it's, it's temporally fine-grained. So we can see over time for that same veteran across multiple pathways, how those pathways are evolving in, co in, in conjunction with time, for example, how much time they spend with the dog. This is key. Um, because it can allow us in the context of randomization to give some understanding about which pathways might be major drivers. Um, and it can certainly at the least allow us to, to compare, you know, how much pathways were activated um, before the dog was trained versus uh, after. Give us, build some hypothesizing on our part, um, some empirical evidence to support hypothesizing. Um, uh, and this ability to distinguish effects across multiple pathways can start to give us some ways of working towards working hypothesis about why we see certain outcomes in terms of um, for certain veterans and not others. Now, we're going to an be analyzing this data with a variety of techniques. Um, some of them are centered around dynamic modeling, particularly in the form of agent-based models, which depicts individuals in their environment and in their interactions. Um, and agent-based models uh, can capture geography, they can capture networks, and can capture sort of rich depictions of behavior of an individual that's contingent on, upon their particular history, for example, and um, by which they interact with, with their environment. Um, and models allow us to, 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 to pose these hypotheses in a, in a very visually, um, uh, often a way that that's quite visually transparent, and to test those hypotheses uh, against against the impressions of others, to put them in the clear light of day, and and allow others to critique them, um, and allow us to collectively refine them. But critically, um, the models allow us to explicate the implications by running a model. We can see over time what are the logical effects of that model in terms of observables, and what this means is. Models here are not serving, um, an implication here is models are not serving as crystal balls, which if they're off base, um, might as well be shattered in terms of their, their value, they're useless. But rather models are, in the words of Jeff McDonald, um, uh, learning processes. They help us learn more quickly, more deeply, and more reliably from data by allowing us to take our mental model, see what the logical implications are by running the model, see the implied dynamics that, that come out of it, and compare it with, with what we know about the situation. This is hard to do when we just rely on informal reasoning. It's hard to, to understand, well, even a very po well-posed theory, which the theories in our mental model are typically not, um, it's very hard for us to go from that to implied dynamics. We're, our theories are too inchoate, but we're also just not very good in our head about understanding the, the implications of them. What does that apply over time? Even the very best, most of us in terms of quantitative reasoning, we fall short in our ability to do that as empirical studies have shown. But if we have a model, it can allow us to map to the implied dynamics and we can test more quickly to what degree our mental model jibes with the available evidence. And of course, we can use it to motivate additional collection of data um, uh, to, to, to test out that model, and most importantly, testing out our theory. Um, so um, testing out our working hypotheses. In short, it can allow us to, to put in place a mechanism to, to learn more quickly when our, our mental models are off base, to more, learn more quickly from the evidence and to, to test our, our mental models um, much more rigorously um, in a way that is, 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 uh, is, is tested in the crucible of, of, of firm understanding of, of their logical implications over time and to what degree that lines up with data. In short, we have a way to debug our thinking much more quickly. Um, we fail early, fail often. We fail forward. We learn more quickly by, by cross-checking ourselves. We, uh, we put a stake in the ground and we, uh, we challenge it and learn more quickly how we can do better. Um, this is how models pick, um, put into it because a model gives us implication about what we should see against a wide variety of pathways. And we can then test that against a wide variety of pathways with the data. 
So, so this is how the models work together with the data, or one of the key ways. Now, a key uh, tool also in this is convergent cross mapping to allow us to test um, empirically to what degree do we see causal impacts between two variables in a, in a directional way. Is, is Y causing X? Is X causing Y or is it reciprocal or neither causing each other? Convergent cross mapping um, is a tool formulated for use in, in, um, in dynamical systems uh, explicated in the pages of science. Um, which our work has shown to be quite reliable in many cases. And we can use this to, to inform the design of our models, what needs to be captured, um, how strong even are certain connections. So that, that has to be taken with a big asterisk because of um, noise can lower the apparent, um, uh, apparent strength of connections. In other cases, we use machine learning processes, hidden markup model, deep learning, um, uh, a technique that's that's not theory based, that's recognizing these empirical regularities, the hidden Markov model, which has more theory in it, to recognize basic things like is the phone even being carried now, time spent inside and outside. These are the types of things we've looked at for years using tools of machine learning very successfully. But we can also sense things like um, using these tools proximity to the dog. Um, how much time are people spending with, with other veterans and, and hopefully recognize reliably uh, flashback occurrence. In higher level uh, information, we can classify whether an opioid disorder is likely reemerged, recognize warning signs for failure to thrive early on, and perhaps classify individuals that's a level of follow-up that they require, such as in work being done with Alex Wong and Regina Capel Health Region for um, those with HIV, where we, uh, we use machine learning methods and, and, and data, uh, seeking to try to classify, does a person need to be, can they be seen only every six months or a year because they're, they're very well structured lives and, and, and very regular, or do they need to be seen every day to have their pills administered at the methadone clinic, um, for example. Here we make use of Bayesian graphical models, hidden Markov models, which are more theory-based as well as as deep, deep learning. In terms of prediction, um, using some of the same methods, um, uh, we're interested in understanding, for example, coming recurrence of opioid disorder. Can we fly ahead of the plane and recognizing early on when someone's likely to, to, to recur into opioid use or very short-term substance use, when they're likely to, to, to use opioids in the very near future in, in a possible, um, uh, possible slip-up? Um, or something that could lead on to a relapse more fully, and the probability they'll bond with a given dog. Now, another set of methods are, are ones that depend on dynamic modeling, and you may wonder why dynamic modeling as well. And this reflects the fact that dynamic modeling is a highly versatile tool. Uh, once we've secured conviction and, and a working hypothesis, not that it, it is true, but it is seems to be hold water uh, at very strong level enough that we're willing to put our stake in the ground and say well you know testing our thinking with this is is much better than just depending on our inchoate thinking in the world let's let's see what the implications of this best going theory are for for uh, for our, our planning we can look at counterfactual situations um recognizing that it's probably the least bad of the alternatives available to us to use this model like Winston Churchill said of democracy, it's the worst of all forms of government except for everything else. And so we can use counterfactual um, investigations with a model like this, recognizing that we have to be humble, that it's, it's, it's not insured. And here we're taking into account the fact that, you know, if we had trouble going from our working hypotheses to what they imply over time by themselves, if we try to layer on understanding of possible interventions, it's going to be typically quite hopeless to understand what their implications are at a in a reliable way and, and to test whether that gives desired outcomes. Models can help us take not only this theory, but these layered interventions, portfolios of interventions, uh, new policies or one-time interventions in which is the individual level or more population level, and help us understand the degree to, to what, did they, what are their logical implications and to test that against empirical observations. So um, we can go with an intervention and see what the outcomes are. So a couple key take home messages. Computational approaches can, are, are not just an alternative to um, 
to, to theory, far from it. They can aid, aid in theory building, theory explications, and yes, they can allow us to capture through techniques like deep learning, such as we're pursuing a tensor flow, allow us to capture patterns that currently lack theoretical foundation, these salient empirical regularities, bearing in mind that without a causal model, it might be hard to explain to people, might be hard to, um, to anticipate how they change under counterfactual situations. A key use of, of this sort of rich data, such as we're collecting from the, the veterans and dogs, is to learn more deeply from interventions, more quickly, more deeply, and more reliably. And a key use to the models is to then take our learning and ask, well, what sort of models will do better? Because both the models and the, the information from the data allow us to resolve things at, at levels of individual pathways, and we can reason about how we can do better in a counterfactual intervention context using the models. Electronically uh, captured data is increasingly ubiquitous and really offers much strength to these analytic approaches. And this new generation of, of analysis methods based in, in, in data science, but also system science, such as agent-based modeling, allow us to much potential for understanding how to intervene more judiciously and allow us to learn more quickly, more reliably, more deeply. But I would argue that in this world, um, we're, we are increasingly casting digital shadows of substance. Um, and the electronic data that we that, that's possible to collect through these shadows, low burden data collection through wearables, for example, um, uh, or through social media interactions, if we look outside the scope of this vignette, um, through smartphone based data, gives us a very rich picture, increasingly rich picture of knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and health behaviors. Um, interactions with the healthcare system um, in a very quick turnaround basis. These are powerful things, but I would argue that this digital shadows that we catch, which grow increasingly substantive, also shape our knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, whether it's vaccination um, hesitancy being discussed on Twitter or whether it's sharing of, of, of workouts on Fitbit Social. Increasingly, we are shaped by this digital world. And if we're not going to address it with our methods, it will still be addressing us. We need to take on the challenge of leveraging this new generation of powerful analysis methods to give us the opportunity to move forward with more efficacious interventions in a very fast changing world, in a world that's beset by all the challenges of complexity. Thank you very much. It's been your honor, my honor to, an honor to me to have your attention and to have your presence here. Uh, please see my other video if you'd like more details on some of our work.